Good evening. It's now 6 p.m., uh, April 11th, and I'd like to call to order this committee of the whole of the Champaign County Board. Um, can I please have a roll call? Esri? Here. Harper? Here. Hartke? Here. James? Here. Jay? Here. Kibler? Langenheim? Here. Maxwell? Here. McGuire? He's here. He was here. He's here. Michaels? Here. Mitchell? Here. Petrie? Here. Quisenberry? Here. Richards? Rosales? Here. McGuire? Here. Schrader? Here. Schwartz? Here. Kurtz? Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, I'd like, uh, what's that? I'm sorry. Oh, Alex? Oh, I'm here. Berkson? Oh, I usually am the last. Mr. McGuire's here, too. Mr. McGuire's here. <laughs> I didn't get to finish. Berkson? Carter? <laughs> Coert? Well, we had a quorum then, we have a quorum now. So we're okay on both counts. Uh, <laughs> good evening, everyone. Mr. Mitchell is here. Okay, I'd like uh, approval. Oh, you're already ahead of me there, Max? Okay. Approval second. of the minutes. I have first Max, a second, and Geraldo. Uh, <coughs> any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Approval of the agenda. So moved by Mr. James, second by uh, Lloyd. Okay. Uh, any changes, discussion on the agenda? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Is there any public participation this evening? Uh, I don't see any. I don't have any cards. So uh, we'll move past public participation into communications. Uh, I know that uh, Lorraine has one. Please uh, turn on your mic, Lorraine. I'd like the uh, county board to uh, take a moment of silence in remembrance of uh, Lyle Shield, who served on the county board for 41 years. Uh, and our condolences go out to the Shields family as well mm -hmm. uh, on his passing. Uh, other communications, uh, on a personal note, uh, uh, first I want to thank the uh, Regional Planning Commission staff and the uh, staff here at Brookings for the wonderful cards that I received uh, during my uh, incarceration at home and in the hospital. Uh, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. And also for those who took time out to send me their emails and cards and, and phone calls. It was uh, very heartening, and uh, thank you so very much for your concern. But as you can see, here I am. Sorry <laughs> to disappoint you, but here I am. So uh, thanks again. I really do appreciate it. Is there any other communication at this point? Okay, let's move on. Uh, I'd like to bring uh, Mr. Quisenberry to the center stage, and I have the gavel for him right here. You're very welcome. All right. Welcome to the policy portion of our agenda. Is it on? Yes. I'll speak closer to it. Yeah, the light's not on, but it is working. All right. Um, uh, the first order of business for the policy personnel and appointments portion of the agenda is we, we have a number of fire protection district appointments and I would in, encourage an omnibus motion for uh, items um, A1 through uh, 14. Okay. Moved uh, by Mr. James, second by Ms. Berkson. Um, Mr. Chair, would you make your appointments, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, let's start off. Uh, number one, Philo Fire Protection District. The applicant is Clifford Gorman. Thomas Borough Fire Protection District, Mer uh, Mervyn Mayer. Sangamon Valley Fire Protection District, Roger Pontoon, Jr. St. Joseph Stanton Fire Department, 
Norman Paul, Ivesdale, Jeff White, Eastern Prairie, Patricia Chancellor, Pesodum, Dennis Butler, Sidoris, Frederick Siebold, Tolono, Roger Hayden, uh, Edge Scott, Mark McDuffie, Windsor Park, Todd Courtney, Ogden Royal, Ken Osterber, Scott, Bernie Magsim, Magsiman, and Broadlands, Lacey Taylor. All right, is there any discussion regarding these appointments? Ms. Petrie. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, mostly this is because I'd want it on the record uh, with a hope that over time we can um, get more applicants and applicants say I'd have a less, uh, what seems to be conflict of interest in their many roles that I read that uh, many of these applicants have. I acknowledge the fact that it is difficult to find people to serve in some of these uh, unique uh, roles, but I do think it's in the best interest if we, uh, these jobs are spread around, many different people taking them on. I notice one gentleman has been in the role for something like 35 years, and I do think it would be nice to bring on new people who can learn from this an individual who's been in a role for 35 years and uh, uh, share that knowledge base. And so it's with that that I'd like to see it on the record. And the second I'd like to see on the record is the uh, new uh, amendment to the Open Meetings Act that went into effect a little over a year ago that anybody who's appointed to uh, such bodies as we're making appointments this evening uh, within the window of time of 90 days of appointment need to uh, take the online Open Meetings Act training and uh, produce a certificate that this has been accomplished. And it's not clear to me yet if there has been a process put in place on how and when that certificate gets presented after their appointment. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. That's unanimous. Uh, the, I would also entertain a omnibus motion for A15 and 16, uh, appointing members to a fine arts review committee for Lincoln Hall and for the new electrical and computer engineering building. Lorraine, second by Astrid. All right, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Fine Arts Review Committee for Lincoln Hall Restoration Project 8300010327. Uh, this is for Shauna Carey and Melvin Scrivaller. And the Fine Arts Review Committee Electrical Computer Engineering Building Project 8300010331. Same applicants, Shauna Carey and Melvin Scrivaller. Is there any discussion? Ms. Petrie. Uh, yes. Um, I made a great deal of effort to send this out to various people, so I uh, want to acknowledge my disappointment that we only have two applicants for two committees, and these two people will serve on both of these committees. I really would have liked to have had at least four applicants, four different applicants. Second is that uh, Melvin did not indicate on his application that he is employed at the university and was very involved in the Lincoln Hall uh, renovation. Uh, that would could lead to the question if there's any conflict of interest that might arise with his role at the university in relationship to uh, what he might be doing on this committee. Uh, Ms. Carey did indicate on her application that should a conflict of interest arise that she would uh, not act on whatever is be before them. So she did acknowledge that potential, but he has not acknowledged that on his application. Mr. Carter. I still have a concern of your point is, well, the point is, I'm going to vote for him. But the point is, somebody asked me next week, something happened. But do you know these in it? No. 
I never see them. What she looked like, I never see them. So this still a problem. I don't mind voting for them. At least they could they could come and introduce themselves and say something. So if, if I'm questioned, I could say that yeah. But now I could see it this evening. I wouldn't know it. I wouldn't even know who these individuals are. I, I can't disagree with that, Mr. Carter. I would assume that if you wanted to be appointed, it would it would be nice to come address the body or at least be available. But in any case, uh, any other comments or questions? Ms. Brookson. I don't see a microphone, please. Thank you. I don't see how being involved in the reconstruction of Lincoln Hall would be a, a, a conflict of interest with putting art in it. For one thing, the state money is there. Nobody has a financial interest in it. And they are separate operations. Mr. Alex. I, I would agree with Ms. Berkson on that. I'm having trouble divining what conflict could exist other than potentially the artist, you know, having a financial interest in somebody who's trying to sell art for the project. I mean, I don't, the fact that they work in the building or are familiar with the building or participate in remodeling the building, I don't see how they're economically benefiting from that. I mean, frankly, if somebody works in the building has to walk by the thing every day, it seems more likely they're going to pick something good. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Alex. All right. No other comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. nay. All right. Um, the next item is just for your information from the Nelson Moore Fairfield Drainage District uh, resignation of John Nelson. Um, Moving on to section B, uh, I'd entertain a motion to accept the county clerk's report and place it on fire, file. <laughs> Mr. McGuire, did you move that as I was misstating what I was? I've got fire protection on the mind and seconded by Ralph. Okay, any, any questions regarding that report? Uh, seeing none, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. Okay, moving right along. Also, we have the Administrative Services Monthly Report in Section C, number one. Uh, I entertain a motion to accept that and place it on file. All right, moved and seconded. Um, any questions for Deb? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. All right, uh, next item on the agenda is I, I'd entertain a motion um, to accept the recommendation of the John Job Content Evaluation Committee for the classifications of the Champaign County GIS positions. Moved. moved by Mr. Alex, seconded by Ms. Berkson. Uh, you will recall that we referred these jobs to that Job Content Evaluation Committee uh, two months ago, I think. And um, I have had an opportunity to sit down and look through these with Deb, uh, com looked at some comparables with the surveys uh, on campus. They, they seem to make sense. Uh, they, they don't create any issues at the moment. And so um, at this point, if you have any questions or comments, let us know. Okay, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. All right, um, I don't believe we have any other business. Um, and for the chair's report, I will, I will mention that I have had some ongoing conversations with Ms. Busey and, and Mr. Kurtz um, regarding uh, the appointment process and, and things that we can do that would add value to it without creating too much more bureaucracy to deal with. Um, and uh, at this point, we're we are also um, taking in information about um, uh, a way to reduce paper. Uh, many, uh, many of us have moved to using uh, tablets or laptops to receive the um, packets and budget materials and such. Um, we think it would, in the long term, probably make sense for us to try to convert wholly to that. 
but we're still still gathering information. Ms. Petrie has provided uh, some some links to some information that we're including in that. If you have uh, information with regard to it, we'd welcome it. And with that, um, I think we have uh, for the for the consent agenda, we have everything but the Fine Arts Review Committee items. Yes. Um, I understand what Patsy's, Patsy's talking about when it comes to people for these appointments and whatnot, but if you look in the rural districts, which many of these are, they couldn't even fill um, terms for their trustees or their board members. So un fortunately, unfortunately, we've got good people that want to do them, but it might be difficult that um, the mindset is such that they've all, it works. And so maybe that's another reason why we're really not getting very many is because there aren't people stepping forward, um, not even in the trustee positions in some of those communities. Yes, I, I know on at least one occasion in the past we had to find someone who didn't live in a drainage district to serve on the drainage district because everybody in the drainage district either didn't want to do it or wouldn't apply or so. Yes, point, point taken. And with that, I am done for policy. Thanks. Thank you, James. All right, let's move on to finance. Mr. Alex. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kurtz, and good evening. Um, <clears throat> first item under finance is the treasurer's report, as usual. Um, Mr. Welch, would you like to comment on your reports? Good evening. And my reports, as usual, are on file on my website. But there is one, uh, one thing on the report I want to talk about briefly, and that is uh, this board uh, a couple of months ago authorized a loan between public safety and general corporate fund of up to $1.5 million. I just wanted to report that on April the 2nd, I did, in fact, loan general corporate $1 million from public safety. I don't think we'll need any more than a million dollars. It's nice to have the 500000 in reserve if we do need it, but it is also exactly what we did last year. April of last year, we also had a million dollars, and we will repay that by November 30th of this year. Second uh, item, uh, many of you may be familiar with or saw the paper where Provena, which is now called Presence Health, has uh, got a refund for the years 2004 and 2006. Uh, if you remember, we have been collecting information in, since 2002, payable in 2003, for the uh, collections that they have each year and waiting for some kind of uh, uh, judgment based on uh, the courts or, in this case, the board or the Department of Revenue to determine if uh, Bravina will get any of this money back. 2002 year, if you can remember, was decided by the Supreme Court. Illinois Supreme Court, and so 2002 has been taken care of. So this is the second time the refunds actually come through based on a ruling. It was an administrative law judge in the hearing section of the Department of Revenue, and he ruled on 2004 and 2006. For those two years, if you just looked at the total collections for, for those two years, it was $2.4 million. The actual ruling came down as a refund of $1.183 million. So I didn't make that refund on, I should say, 97% of that money is one TIF district in the city of Urbana. The cost to Champaign County was $3,805, and general corpus portion of that was $1,070. So, gets you a little bit up to date where we are. There is, they still have an outstanding uh, uh, ruling waiting between, before the Department of Revenue for 2010, and so we don't know what that's gonna be. So, it continues on. I'm sure I'll be long gone by the time this Provena thing is all done, said and done. Hopefully I will be. And finally, uh, this time next month when I, when I come in front of you, you'll already have tax bills in front of you. Tax bills will be, mailed, will be mailed out May the 3rd. You'll have two due dates of June the 3rd and September the 3rd. It'll be our 11th, I believe, straight year of being on time, which is a, a product of the assessors and the township assessors, the board of review, the supervisor of assessments, County clerk does a tremendous amount of work in this field. And of course the treasurer's office and the IT department. So we, we work collaboratively. We meet on a monthly basis at a tax cycle group. 
And I think that's a really good uh, reason to tax bills go out on time. Not only is it helpful to us as a taxing body to get tax money starting in May, but it also gives the taxpayers the opportunity to have three months in between the installments. I can guarantee that there are several counties in the state of Illinois where they get tax bills out and you have a bill due in August and September or September and October or all of it at one time. I've seen all kinds of things go on. So we're fortunate that we work well together here and uh, just want to report that this is another year that looks like it's going in the right direction as well. So I'd ask that uh, my report be accepted and placed on file. I'd be sure glad to answer any questions if I could. Moved by Mr. Jay, second by Mr. Mitchell. Uh, would anybody like to ask questions of the treasurer? Ms. Michaels. As we're winding down um, receiving last year's taxes, the delinquency, is that up or down from before? I mean, it seems to be that we don't have as many tax sales, but maybe I'm wrong. Actually, tax sale items have kind of steadily increased in two, since 2006, but in small increments. I think now, I think last year we had 1,278 parcels that went to the tax sale in real estate, 157 mobile homes that went to tax sale. Uh, of the 1,278, 1,257 were purchased at the tax sale. The average uh, weighted bid was 3.09, could have been as high as 18%, could be as low as zero. If you remember Madison County, that the treasurer has just pleaded guilty in federal court and was going to prison uh, based on the fact that his tax sales had an average of 18%, but he's also getting $300,000 in campaign contributions from the tax buyers. <laughs> so he's going where he deserves to go. But no, I, I believe that the tax sale uh, has been as low as 570 items, and it's slowly, I can't think, incremental up, up, up to almost 1,300 parcels. Thanks. I'm sorry, Mr. Carter. I just have a sort of a quick question. I remember when the housing market around here just shot up. Boom. Mm -hmm. Then it turned around and fell down. How do you adjust to that? Well, a little out of my realm. I mean, I'm a, I'm a collection. I don't do much of the assessing, but I can <laughs> tell you that what people don't seem to realize is that it's an average. It's a three-year average, and it's by neighborhood. So they, what, from what I understand is that the, the swings and valleys are not as much as you might think they are when you see them in terms of three years time frame. One year, you can see a drop. Maybe somebody will come in and they'll say to me, well, my value's down 30%. Right. But if you average it out over three years, it's not quite as bad as you might think it might be. So I think that's what people, people miss. It's an edge. It's done in, in a, in a na neighborhood kind of mode, not an individual house. They don't price ch chase. The assessors are not allowed to say, your house sold for X, so we're going to assess it at X. They're not allowed to do that. So that's putting on a hat I don't actually have. I'm a treasurer, not an assessor, but uh, I've been accused of both. <laughs> I'd rather be a treasurer. Any more questions? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the report and placing it on file, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, and I, I, we do sincerely appreciate the tax bills getting out on time. I mean, I don't exactly like seeing it show up in my mailbox, but compared to, it is very unfortunate how few counties are able to do that. And I think it speaks well to your staff and the, and, uh, the yeah, rest of the county the folks. Tax uh, cycle, that's right. The whole cycle that we're able to you do bet. that. Um, while we have you here, uh, we have a resolution authorizing the county board chair to assign a mobile home tax sale certificate of purchase, permanent parcel number 25-900-0042. May I have a motion to approve that, Mr. Esri and Mr. Kibler? Uh, Danny, you want to talk about that sure. at all? Sure. Uh, we've seen this before, uh, often. This is a mobile home that went to tax sale. No one purchased it. The, uh, ex the, uh, the expiration of the... Uh, I can't think of the word, but uh, it's the, uh, you know, the redemption period, I'm sorry. Uh, it's two years, and so that ran out. The county actually doesn't take title to it, but it takes ownership of the certificate, and we're now going to a, an a auction, and that this person uh, paid, what, $695 as their trailer, so we're just transferring the title to them. It's a good thing because it gets it back on the productive rolls, and there'll be tax money coming in from that point on. I might often add that uh, the average mobile home bill is $74. Thank you, sir. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. Hey, thanks. I'll move on to the auditor who has his reports on the website.
and uh, we'll, as usual, speak to us about them. If you have any questions about them, I just ask that you accept them and place it on file. Um, may I have a motion to do so? so Mr. Uh, Mitchell and Mr. James. Um, I just want to point out to the board, uh, at three months into the year, we expect to see it. We'd be at about 25% on expenditures. Looks like we're about 28, so we're doing pretty well there. Uh, you can go through the line items and see what we're over budget and under budget on. Obviously, revenues are significantly below that because we get so much money as a result of the uh, property tax process, which won't start showing up until until May, as Mr. Walsh said. So, excuse me, Mr. Welch said. Um, if there are no questions, uh, all in favor of accepting the report, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you. Thank you. And I placed the uh, bad purchases report on your desk. So if you have any questions about that, I'd be glad to try and answer it. Otherwise, email me, call me. I'll give you answers next week. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Uh, we have a nursing home monthly report, including uh, some narrative information, which was provided by the uh, Champaign County uh, Nursing Home Board of Directors. Uh, Mr. Maxwell and Mr. Kibler here, if there are any questions. Uh, Related to what's going on with the nursing home board, Mr. Did I say I'm looking at I'm looking at you. That's I'm why I said that. You, Mr. Hartke <laughs> and Mr. Maxwell are here and can answer questions about the uh, recent nursing home board directors meeting. Mr. Quisenberry, I would just like to thank Mr. Maxwell for his his summary of of the meetings. I find that very useful and I appreciate it. Okay, now that I know everybody's names. Um, <laughs> Any other comments or questions with regard to the nursing home report? Uh, seeing none, uh, I guess we'll have a motion to accept that and place it on file. So moved. Mr. Quisenberry and Ms. Petrie. Yes. Did you have a question? I did. Ms. Petrie. Thank you very much. Um, um, would Mr. Harkey or Mr. Maxwell uh, talk a bit more about the bad debt numbers for all of us? Microphone. Unfortunately, bad debt is part of the doing business at the nursing home, at a, any nursing home. You can't collect 100%. You have a certain amount that you can't collect. Um, the, the current management of the nursing home has been going back as far back as 2005 and trying to resolve those issues and has written off, uh, I think, and I, these numbers are, are coming off the top of my head I just, as I remember them from the other night, around $550,000 uh, previously. And uh, we're going to have to write another uh, 292000 I believe, uh, currently. And... Uh, then we should be getting close to being caught up. Obviously, uh, nobody likes the bad debt. Part of it is because some of the debt wasn't followed up on, uh, especially Medicaid and Medicare. And in other words, if we'd have a, a problem that we didn't get addressed as far as documentation, that sort of thing, eventually we would not be able to collect on those. And I think Medicare uh, basically has to be touched at least once a year uh, in order to keep it current. So the current management, management is going back and trying to correct some of those old uh, problems. It's making us look a little bad right now, uh, but something has to be done. Ultimately, the goal will try to be uh, we can get our, our bad debt down in the half a percent of gross range. And I think right now we're looking at around 2%. Still within the norms for nursing homes, at least that's what I've been told. But granted, it's, it's simply not acceptable, at least in my way of thinking it isn't. Uh, yeah, Gary's point's right there about um, it is too high, but it is within range of what nursing homes have. Um, there's a lot of reasons this happens. This is cases where 
uh, we don't get the Social Security supplemental payment because, according to federal law, Social Security goes to a person, not to an organization. We don't get to take people's Social Security. It goes to them. In some cases, it goes to their children, and these children don't always pay their parents' debts on time. That is, that is some of this money. Uh, others' money is people who pass away and, and don't get a final bill or don't have an inheritor who's going to be paying off their debt. Um, also, this is money that goes back um, total, I believe the numbers were, to 2003. Um, a lot of this is catch up from before MP8 came into place and there was a strict billing system. Somebody constantly watching this stuff and, and, and billing out, as, as Gary said, it has to be billed regularly. You can't just come after somebody three years later after not sending them a bill and say you still owe us money. Um, it's being worked on. They, it's part of the corporate com or the, the compliance program that we're working on as board of directors. Um, the staff and especially Karen Nofke, who's the administrator, are very aware of this and, are, and in the future we're going to see this number come down. But we're talking about almost $800,000, is that? And why are why is it we're just hearing about this if it started back in 2004? What is there no line in this budget that discusses bad debt? I, I mean, if I, I may. and I, I know you're trying to just re fill us in on what's happening, but um. uh, my understanding is that I mean, like a lot of this debt happened before we even transferred the nursing home over to the board of directors. Um, it was happening during times of very bad, poor management. Um, it's being caught up on. As far as it being reported, I mean, this new number that we're dealing with now is the 292, which are two different years. That's 2011, 2012. The other numbers were written off in the past, so I'm sure that that information, I was not a member of this board, so I can't speak to this, whether that information was dispersed or not, but I'm assuming it was. It would be required. So uh, this is not something we're really just finding about. It is something that, though, you know, uh, MPA has been dealing with a lot of fires over the last several years, and, you know, this is where we're getting to this one. You know, you can't put them all out at once, and this is definitely one we're going to hit on along with some other things. But I think that the, the policies have been put in place to start chasing this money down a little more. Plus, you know, there's also a point to be said that, you know, we aren't putting people who are Medicare qualified out on the streets just because they can't, you know, that last check didn't come through immediately. So that, that's part of the reason for our county, board, or our county nursing home to exist. Ms. Michaels. Thanks, guys, because it's really helped us to understand things, especially on the finance side here, too. Um, I almost wonder, and I'm maybe you don't know the answer, and that's fine, because I understand that you're not the management, you're part of the board, but something that, that maybe bothers me a little bit is to wonder how old are the outstanding debts, because I would think that people would get their income monthly now, Granted, maybe they're one or two months behind, but more than that, I think that would be very difficult. Maybe that's something you could suggest to the group when you talk to them later. Yeah. If I can make one kind of point on that, these a lot of these are bills that are over a year, well, in a, more than a year in arrears, um, and in fact, even further. And a lot of them are not people who are currently there and behind a couple of months. They're people who are no longer at the nursing home, and we've lost the ability to chase down the debts for some reasons. Again. You're absolutely right. These are things we need to work further on, and we are, so. Uh, I think Ms. Schwartz was next. Um, just a quick comment. I think Mr. Maxwell mentioned a lot of that is actually Medicare and Medicaid. These will not be private people. And some of it, I don't know about the recent, but I know in 2008 when I looked at finances, some of the issues were we were, and this is way before MPA, we were admitting people who were not authorized or during times we were sanctioned. Mm -hmm. And so they told us, if you will admit anybody, you will not be paid for that. So I'm not sure how much money specifically is from that, but some of these issues are. So the big money, I think, is Medicare, Medicaid, much more than private people. Not that we shouldn't collect from them, but mm -hmm. just where the numbers are. Uh, Mr. Harper? Yeah, I uh, appreciate what Josh and Gary are doing, but uh, are you sure they can get a grasp, the CMPA can get a grasp? I mean, we're talking $800,000 of taxpayer dollars. Over 10 years, yeah, so okay. Kind of reduces the shortfall. Yes, I think they can. I mean, you know, it may, it may take staffing up. Right now they're telling us that it will not take staffing up, that we will not need a new person, that they can do it with current staff. Uh, the current staff has to be trained and be diligent. Um, but, and that's something for managers to watch over. And again, we, these are all things that, that will take time to come out in the end, but management and the board certainly will be overseeing. All right, thank you, Josh. 
Ms. Petrie. Uh, did either of you ask um, in relationship to the length of time one can go after a bad debt? Aren't there some points of diminishing return? Is it 10 for Social Security and for Medicaid? Gary? Um, you're asking a legal question. I don't know. I think the practical part of the is, is practical. One, you can't go after somebody that doesn't have anything to speak of. I mean, some of this debt is, is, is for that reason. One, you can't, you can't go after Medicaid and Medicare once uh, uh, you just can't go after them. I mean, you can file your claims and you can resolve those claims with them in a timely manner. But once you get beyond that, either it's flat denied or you uh, don't follow up in a timely manner and, and you go past the deadline to file, then uh, uh, your hope of collecting an additional money from Medicaid and, or Medicare is pretty uh, small. Okay, thank you. I mean, we've had this issue of bad, I mean, there's been a bad debt line in the nursing homes budget for a long time. Any organization that serves people, especially without people without a lot of money is going to is going to end up with some bad debts. It does raise an interesting question though. If we submit if the nursing home submits a claim to a payer, like an insurance company, Medicaid, Medicare, and it's denied, is that considered a bad debt or does that get essentially is that get accounted for somewhere else because it's something that sh shouldn't have been collectible in the first place? No, the way they do revenues is as soon as they submit a claim, they count it as revenues. Okay. And so, so any, what won't be paid will So be, anything that's a denied claim will, will ultimately bad. get written off as bad debt. Correct. So, uh, un uncollectible so expenses receivable. are later on. They don't match the timing. But revenues, as soon as the claim is submitted, they count it as revenues. And that's really part of the issue. So it's, if they wouldn't count it as revenues, it wouldn't look mm -hmm. like bad debt. Josh. That's part of the reason we've instituted a pretty serious policy of not accepting Medicare pending or Medicaid pending patients. People already have to have their Medicaid confirmed that they are going to get it paid before we'll let them in. Now, whether that'll be paid on time, of course, is part of the issue. But we are we do not allow anyone in until they have their Medicaid confirmed. Yeah, but the, re, uh, the other part is the rehab treatment that they get. So you might be Medicaid approved, but the Medicare part of that or the rehab. And so that's a big chunk of the payments. And that's at his conference. Ms. Michaels. Um, just as a suggestion, when we have these bad debts, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, whatever it is, just thinking as a business here, um, you know, I don't know how MPA works things, but I would strongly suggest that after 120 days, they, they just get written off. And then if you collect it, you collect it, and you might suggest or ask them what their policy is for how long, because then we'd know we'd be doing something every year even though it averages out to 80 a year, we'd be doing something every year and it wouldn't just hit us like a couple hundred thousand all at once. I think that's what they're driving towards. Isn't? Okay, great. 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 Uh, Ms. Berkson? Uh, some, of the, some of the Medicare and Medicaid patients are eight and nine months in arrears, so you can't write them off in 120 days. <laughs> a year, maybe. I think like Ms. Michael's point is essentially if we know, if it's very unlikely to be collected, <laughs> it probably gives a more accurate sense of the financial condition of the home if we acknowledge that. And it sounds like that's where we're going. I, are there any additional comments or questions? I think it's uh, Mr. Carter. Is, is this the state's problem on this Medicaid? And, yes. And the feds, but yes. Well, the patient... I understand it. What? Don't they get that money from your part A and B? No, that's Medicare. That's for seniors. Medicaid is for poor, for poor folks and run more by the state. Oh, people that don't have any. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, I think this was a productive discussion. I assume Mr. Harkey and Mr. Maxwell will take our comments back to the board and we'll move forward. And appreciate uh, the, everybody. Uh, contributing their thoughts. Uh, seeing no further comments, uh, all those in favor of accepting the report and placing on file say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, moving on to budget amendments and transfers. Our first is from the Animal Control Department. It's increased appropriations of $6,687 to account for uh, the increase in fees billed by Metcad. May I have a motion? 
Mr. Jay and Mr. Mitchell. Uh, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, next budget amendment is from uh, Child Support Services from the Circuit Clerk. Uh, Ms. Blakeman is here tonight, and I will ask her to speak to this. This is for $24,500 from the fund balance. While she's walking up here, I will point out this is not the general corporate fund fund balance. This is the Child Support Services Fund fund balance. I would make the motion to bring that on the Mr. Harkey, thank you, and Ms. Michaels. Good evening. Uh, I'm Katie Blakeman, Circuit Clerk. Uh, this uh, budget amendment proposal that I put forward is to pay uh, for the data conversion cost uh, from converting our child support case information from the County 400 system to JANO, which is the case management system that we use for all other case types. Currently, we have a uh, maintenance contract with JANO uh, that include that we are paying $100,000 a year to JANO for that uh, maintenance contract, and that includes the child support module. We have not, up to this point, used that child support module. Uh, we have continued to use the County 400 system, which means that my staff, uh, the child support <laughs> staff are actually using uh, a separate system than everyone else uh, and it also means that the judiciary the judges do not have access to that information from their terminals on the bench and the uh, state's attorney's office would not have access to that information uh, when they are reviewing cases so this will allow the judges to be able to view child support payment history uh, it will also allow the uh, state's attorney's office to better serve uh, the child support enforcement cases, uh, and this this will also allow us to accept child support payments at the counter, which we're no at this point not able to do. Uh, since everyone at the counter has access to Jano, we have to run back and get someone who is a child support specialist to come forward and, and assist with that. So we will be better serving our uh, customers that way. We also, at this time, uh, pay $20,000 a year to IT for maintenance of that uh, County 400 system and the reason that we do that and the reason that they maintain that system is because the child support data is still on the AS 400 the County 400 and not on Jano so once we make this conversion they will no longer have to uh, maintain that and we will no longer have to appropriate $20,000 for that so this will come uh, from the fund balance of the child support service fund uh, which as of today has a balance of $418,143. Uh, so it is more than sufficient to cover this expenditure. So we are asking for that uh, for this month. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, were you raising your hand or just pointing Mr. Harkey out? Mr. Harkey. Uh, first, I want to welcome you to the 21st century at the Circuit Clerk's Office, finally. Um, and I, let me get this clear, you're going to spend $24,500 and probably save twenty grand a year. Mm -hmm. That's right. It, isn't it almost negligence that this hasn't been done before, folks? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I can say there were some programming issues that Jano had to resolve, uh, and we, in fact, will be the first county to implement this, uh, for, that's a Jano county that will be implementing this uh, child support module. So, uh, at least to my knowledge, we will be. Very diplomatic. Mr. Kibler. <laughs> diplomatic indeed. Uh, as a data guy, I know that the transitions from one to another may take a considerable amount of time. What's the timeline to convert over? I assume the 20,000 savings won't happen this year and maybe even not next year because you have to maintain both systems until mm -hmm. it's all good and done. Uh, how long until everything's moved over? Well, as I spoke with uh, Representative, well, the um, president of JANO yesterday, he said they would be ready to begin the conversion at the end of this month, and they anticipate that it would take about four weeks. So actually, uh, it could happen pretty quickly, and perhaps by the end of this, uh, this next quarter, we'll be able to uh, do, uh, we'll be all ready to go with uh, the child support uh, cases on Jano. So there's no reason or any desire at this point to keep County 400 as a backup just in case for six-month period, anything like that? Uh, that would probably, I think Andy Rhodes would be a better person to ask about that. Uh, we. We may need to hold on to that for a little bit longer, but um, just as a backup and to make sure we work out any kinks that there might be in using that the, the Jano system. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Mm -hmm. Mr. Quisenberry. 
Yeah, I have I, I have a question and then and then a comment. Um, the twenty thousand that's paid to IT for maintaining the system, um, I I'd, I'd like to make sure that that's passing through to somewhere else that IT has to then pay for it, or is it? I mean, it, it's a zero sum game if if we stop paying IT twenty thousand dollars for it. Where does that come back in if it if it's not passed through to some other external body? I asked basically the same question to Ms. Busey, so I'm going to let her answer it to you as well. We think too much alike, apparently. <laughs> um, it will be uh, what could be viewed as a revenue loss to general corporate. Um, however, um, this formula, which is uh, charging the $20,000 for the AS400 storage libraries stored on the AS400, is uh, probably close to 30 years old, and it really hasn't been revisited in the last 10 or 12 years. So it was something we would have revisited anyway, but we knew this was coming, and what IT has done in the interim, and as you probably all recall, starting with this year, IT is billing non-general corporate funds for their services. So while it may not be that $20,000 is coming from the Child Support Services Fund next year, there are a number of funds which the circuit clerk and the courts um, control where IT provides services and those funds will be being billed. So actually the revenue anticipated is actually going up for IT and general corporate fund even with this change. Okay, thank you. And then um, kind of as a follow-up, um, uh, we were paying um, maintenance on this module that we have not been using. Do you know how long we've been paying that uh, To my knowledge, we've been paying for it since we converted to Jano and so in, in 2008. In a sense, um, we're now getting value for our money as opposed to just kind of throwing it away. So I think that's reasonable to point out as well. Thank you, Ms. Petrie. Uh, just a clarification, the 24500 is a one-time? Yes, that Thank is you. a one-time expenditure uh, just for the data conversion cost. So that pays for the labor for uh, the uh, JANO staff to do the actual data conversion. And it also includes some uh, training costs. So they will come and train our staff on how to use that module. Okay, and JANO has been in place, what, for a decade? Uh, just since 2008. Oh, okay. <laughs> Or, well, all of, yeah. I was just okay. multiplying times 20,000. Uh, thank you for your comments and questions, and thank you for coming and uh, talking to us, uh, Ms. Blakeman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kibler's made a motion. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, that's it for budget amendments and transfers. Uh, we have a request from the facilities director. Uh, to apply and if awarded accept money from uh, DCEO to partially defray the cost of tuning up some of the county's boilers. May I have a motion? So moved. Mr. Thank J you. and uh, I think Mr. Hartke. Any discussion? Or is that Mr. Kibler? Ms. Petrie. Uh, I'm delighted uh, to see that um, this is a process precedent-setting the event that we're going after some grant money, and I do hope that this lays the groundwork of expectation that other entities, when they uh, need to go out and buy or um, repair anything, that we do look to see if there's grant money to help with the cost. Thank you, Ms. Petrie. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. We'll forward that to the full board. Uh, moving on to the county administrator's report, uh, we have a general corporate fund fiscal year 2013 budget report and budget change report, which were handed out. Deb, do you have any comments to make? Well, there's one thing I would like to point out. It's on the first page um, of the general corporate fund revenue projection report, the top line property taxes. You have never seen this before. I always project that we will receive all of our property taxes, and this projection shows that we will see a shortfall of $163,200 in our property taxes this year. That is a result of the fact that Carl filed for an exemption on the last day for which an exemption could be filed or close to it. 
and um, the exemption is allowed because the legislature changed the law regarding exemptions for health care facilities last year, so it was automatic that they received the exemption. And this all happened too late in the tax cycle to um, apply the change to the EAV. So the exemption is being treated as a certificate of error which means all the taxing districts with Carl properties within their districts will receive levies that are smaller than what they anticipated when they adopted their levies. If you look at the back of this handout, the last page, you'll see the impact on the county's levies. Um, the general corporate fund is the largest loss at 163200 basically. But um, Mental Health Board will lose 74000 the DD Board about $68,000, um, $41,000 to Highway, $20,000 to County Bridge. All of these officials are aware that their revenue this year will be less than what was budgeted or projected. This is a one-time event. It will not affect um, property taxes for next year. Um, we will be able to use the PTEL or tax caps calculation based on the original aggregate levy that we thought we would collect this year. So it will not impact next year or ensuing year property taxes, but it is something that we will be dealing with this year. Even with that, the rest of the revenues um, are coming in very solidly close to where budgeted. So with the exception of the real estate transactions are still up. So you see about a third of the way down that first group, that revenue line is projected to come in at 342000 more than originally budgeted, which is the bulk of why we think we'll have 101% instead of just 100% of revenues this year. Um, if you turn to the expenditure side, right now it looks like we will underspend personnel expenditures. I've looked and looked at this. Based on the current numbers, this is what the projection would be, but I will be amazed if it is actually this good at the end of the <laughs> fiscal year. Um, we're probably going to overspend on commodities, and if you look at purchase document stamps, you'll see that one is projected that we'll spend 340000 more than budgeted. That correlates back to the revenue from the um, real estate transactions on page one. So those sort of balance each other out. Um, the summary shows that based on projected revenues and expenditures, we would end this year with a $300,000 um, revenue positive year, which keeps us um, at or slightly above our current fund balance goal. Um, on paper, the budget right now has a $722,770 deficit, and that's primarily due to two changes that have been made, one for um, forgiving the nursing home loan of $330,000 and one for uh, the corrections contract, which cost us $141,000. So those are the highlights. I just wanted to make sure you're aware of them. The budget change re report uh, only change from last month is the $141,000 for corrections. Mr. Quisenberry. Yes, Deb, I know we've talked about this before, but I, I, I have to ask, how many other taxing bodies are impacted by this exemption um, that Carl received? The most significant um, bodies to be impacted are the Urbana School District is the number one, and their loss in revenue is about $3 million. The Urbana Park District and City of Urbana also are significantly impacted. And then other Urbana taxing districts, and then Parkland is impacted because they're a countywide like we are. Um, so any countywide taxing district is impacted to an extent. So we, do, we know that it's not like a long-term issue with tax caps, we don't have to worry about losing ground because of the tax cap laws. Right. But um, is it is it a flaw in the exemption mechanism that allows for an entity like this to apply for the exemption in such a way that essentially these taxing bodies set their rates without knowing that this is going to be approved or not? It is, and in fact, your real estate tax cycle group has already begun talking to legislators to ask that the law be changed to require that that deadline be 90 days earlier than it is now so that this would not reoccur. It's not likely to occur with us again because we know we have two major hospitals and from now on they're going to be exempt, but in other areas where something like this could occur. So that is being that has been proposed and it's being looked at. So like if a new private clinic 
right. came online, yeah. that would be where it would happen unexpectedly. Well, and, and any of those entities that they be required to file by September 30th instead of December 30th. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess I should mention with regard to that, uh, I should thank the state's attorney's office who did considerable research on this. Initially, there was concern that this might essentially be a permanent, you know, several million dollar a year hit to the school districts and so forth because it could reduce, it basically be a, a lost year for the purposes of the tax caps. But they did enough investigation to conclude that we can, in fact, uh, adjust property taxes as if we had collected this money in the first place for future years. So it's a hit for those districts. A comment about the urbana schools, I think Mr. Quisenberry could confirm this, but uh, I believe that they were holding uh, most of this money in escrow. Yeah, I think it's been the, I, I don't speak for the school district, I but I think it's been their practice as this has been ongoing to escrow this money so that they wouldn't be caught. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter. Well, I could say the state law is, uh, as I understand it, hinges around the provision of uh, indigent care. So if the hospital provides essentially as much, as much or more value in care to the indigent as it would receive, as it would pay in the, in the uh, as it would receive for the tax exemption, then they're entitled to the tax exemption. Well, we lost a uh, yeah, million dollars. <laughs> we lost half a million dollars. Five hundred and sixty something. I would love for you to go to Springfield and explain that to the legislature, Mr. Carter. I mean, I'm, uh, the, law, law, the law is they're entitled to the exemption, and, and the treasurer's got to give it to him if the court says he's got to give it to him. Well, as, as uh, Ms. Busey said, uh, you know, the, the, uh, those involved in, in the property taxes here at the county level are already talking to legislators to try to make sure that this, at least, you know, we can't help us, but we may be able to help other counties that that fall into the same trap. I'm sorry. The reason I'm saying that, I, I've been on the board of Champaign County Healthcare Consumers ever since it formed. And we have a problem with them about this stuff. I, I agree with you, Mr. Carter. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a tough issue getting, getting care provided to the indigent. I mean, Carl is a, is a major employer and does a lot of good in the community, but this is an issue where people are going to have considerable disagreements over whether they're entitled to this exemption or not. But now they're taking up all my little neighborhood. Well, I used to, I used to go out and get enough boat and go back to the house. They done destroyed that and closed the streets. I can't cut and go home like, oh, oh man. I hear you. Are there any other comments or questions on the County Administrator's reports. If not, I would entertain a motion to receive them and place them on file. Mr. Quisenberry and Mr. Rosales, all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, thanks, Deb. Uh, the next item, this is the tail end of the item that we took up under policy related to the, re the reclassification of the Champaign County uh, GIS consortium positions. Uh, the, the, this is essentially setting the salary ranges based on the output of the Job Content Evaluation Committee. I may have a motion to so forward this to the full board. Mr. Kurtz, uh, second, Mr. Esri. Any additional discussion that didn't happen during policy? Uh, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. Aye, opposed, no. Um, forward that. And finally, uh, Deb has a financial forecast for a couple of our key funds. Uh, this is a memorandum that's included in the packet. Uh, she also has a brief presentation uh, going over this stuff, which I will ask her to give now. And uh, just to put this in some context, this is essentially because we're getting ready to go into the budget cycle for fiscal year 2014, and we need to have an idea where some of these funds stand. So, Deb, take it away. Sure. 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 Sure.
Sorry, I guess I shouldn't. I guess we should have sprung us on. Free advertising for the projector maker. Okay. Um, this is a financial forecast for the general corporate, public safety, sales tax, and capital asset replacement funds. The objective of this forecast is to provide to you, the county board, um, facts and information regarding these three funds as they interrelate with each other, as you embark upon, as, as Chris said, the budget process and decision making with regard to moving forward um, and how these funds are managed. This forecast was developed by looking at our recent past, the last five years of time and how our money has been spent and how it has come in. And then looking forward, uh, using information we know from the past and information we know based on today's economic environment and what we might anticipate, to look at a five-year forward look with fiscal 13, this current fiscal year, as the base year, and then four years out from there. So in this forecast, there are some key assumptions for the general corporate fund. They're in your packet, they're here. I only want to highlight the ones where there are notes because you can see what they are. The first one is the property tax, which is projected to increase by 4.88% in fiscal 2014. Uh, we already know that the CPI for property tax increases in 2014 is 1.7%. However, in this current year, 2013, we are paying off an early retirement incentive debt that has been paid out of the IMRF fund and that has been funded every year from the property tax for the IMRF fund, which gives us $263,000 of property tax that we can reallocate to the general corporate fund in fiscal 2014 because <coughs> the IMRF fund will not need it. Historically, the general corporate fund has given some of its property tax uh, growth ability to the IMRF fund when it needed it, so it's logical that we would make, take that step. Uh, if you go down a ways, you see rent is projected to go up 122.4% in fiscal 2014. That's the result of the fact that ILEAS uh, paid rent for their facility in advance. They paid through this current year, 2013, and those rent payments were received in prior fiscal years. The last one, I believe, was received in 2011. So we will see an increase in our rent line of about $400,000 in fiscal 14. Um, the, the two capital fund, uh, and we'll look at this a little bit later, but that increases 356%. That's an expenditure in fiscal 2014. And that's a result of the fact that the facilities committee has recommended and that has been built into these projections. Um, the set aside of $313,000 starting in fiscal 2014 to fund roof replacements. And every following year of this projection includes those roof replacements. The projection also includes an additional $125,000 to begin funding uh, capital future reserve for all the technology and equipment that has not been funded in the past several years. And finally, in debt, just in looking forward, you'll see that our debt expenditures begin to decline, especially in 16 and 17. In fiscal year 16, we will pay off a $52,500 uh, loan from the Regional Planning Commission to General Corporate for this building that will end its 20-year cycle at that point. So we'll see $52,500 in savings. And in fiscal 2017, in 16, we pay off the debt service for the highway building, which General Corporate has been paying about $95,000 a year for that debt service. It's paid off in 16, so we'll see that savings in fiscal year 17. Um, the general corporate fund revenue, as you all know, property tax is a big piece of it, 20%, 27% of the total revenue. And because of the concentrated receding in the second and third quarters of the fiscal year, we have to, be, we have to maintain a fund balance to cover the first quarter of the fiscal year to get to the point where we start receding that. Historically, um, the property tax exhibits stable and steady increases, which are reflective of the stability of the local economy here in terms of property values and growth. 
We have not yet seen a real significant decrease in uh, equalized assessed valuations of properties in Champaign County. That's partly because uh, what we have seen is when agricultural land increases, it has correlated to times when residential property values have decreased and they've sort, sort of counterbalanced each other. So that's a benefit we have. Uh, pro projections going forward anticipate no increase to the equalized assessed value and modest CPI increases. So you can see that the property tax has increased every year, even throughout the economic recession, and is projected to con continue those gradual increases of about two, two and a quarter percent per year. Mr. Kibler. Thank you, Debs. Does 2014 reflect that we're going to be at 13 months and whatnot since we're changing our calendar the year? property tax will always only be 12 months at a time. Oh, so it's not yeah. impacted by the change in the, so you know, like the personnel wages and health insurance, those percentages that you have. None before. of this takes into Move account on. that 13 month year. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> sales taxes are another uh, primary revenue source for us. The sales taxes that we're looking at here are the one cent collected in the unincorporated, the quarter cent countywide general sales tax, and the use tax, which is collected by the state and distributed back to us based on population. And the sales taxes reflect economic trends. So here's what happened to sales taxes from 2008 through 2012 in terms of percent of change each year. In 2008, all the sales taxes were up. The quarter cent was up the lowest rate at about 4%. The one cent and the use tax were both up over 10%. And then 2009 hits, and they all dropped significantly. The largest drop in the history that we have going back to 1980 in sales taxes. Um, they... The use tax continued to drop in 2010, whereas the quarter cent and one cent rebounded a little bit at about a 2% level. And then you can kind of read it out from there. The projections for going forward are that the quarter cent would see an annual increase of about 2.75%, the use tax 2%, and the one cent flat. Because the one cent is more volatile, and um, I do believe we may be seeing some decreasing um, retail in, in our unincorporated area where we collect the one cent, so it is projected at a flat rate. So although those were volatile, when you look at the combined totals, you see there was a significant drop in 2009, and it took us until basically 2013 to get back to the 2008 levels of sales taxes. But there has been a slow and steady you know, progression moving forward, and this, this projection anticipates that that will continue. The income tax is um, another uh, fairly important uh, component of our sales and income taxes from the state. This, this diagram doesn't directly correlate to what we actually received each fiscal year because in fiscal year 9 and 10, we only received 10 months of revenue. And in fiscal year 11 and 12, we received 13 months of revenue. So I equalized it a little bit, taking, you know, one, one borrowing back. So you're only looking at what would really look like 12 months of revenue in 11 and 12 and 11 months in 9 and 10. And you can see that it has also been increasing. The current trends look like the income tax should continue increasing. But if you look at it, you see all the way out to 2017, we barely get back to where we were in 2008. So this has de definitely been an area where we have certainly lost income. I like that approach by the state. We'll give you 10 months this year and yeah. then make it up by giving you 13 months. months. And they're still two months behind yeah. from where yeah. they yeah. were. <laughs> yeah. They're hoping we didn't notice that. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, fees are about 16% of the total revenue for General Corp. They are defined by statute. The county board has the discretion in many fees to determine whether to adopt them at all, and if they do adopt them, whether to adopt them at the level uh, at the statutory maximum that the state has um, has defined. Some fees can be set by the county board above the statutory mandate if the county board does a cost analysis study to document that the actual cost of providing those services is more than the statutory maximum. The Champaign County actually did that in 2003 and correspondingly we increased the sheriff and county clerk fees. Additionally, in 2003, the legislator, legislature increased all the statutory mandates for the circuit clerk fees. And the county board adopted resolution number 4725, adopting all of those new maximums in 2003, which was really good for 2004. Because you can see the circuit clerk fees went up a little over a half a million dollars in that year as a result of those fee increases. 
We paid for the Maximus study to have the cost analysis study done, and you can see it had little impact on our overall fee revenue. With the sheriff's fees, the ones that can be increased are for service process, civil service process, things like that, and he has competitors in the private market, and he will tell you that it's not such a good idea to increase those fees because he'll just lose business and you could actually end up bringing in less. So at this time, we're not recommending another fee study because um, there wasn't really that much of an impact. You can see that overall, fees tend to remain fairly stable. This is a look at the general corporate fund fees total over this period in time. Ironically, they went up in 9 and 10 slightly, dropped again mm -hmm. in 11, but are projected, to, again, to remain fairly stable. And um, some of that increase in 9 and 10 uh, was probably a result of the counties initiating a contract with Harris and Harris for collections. And we saw some increases in collections on um, back fees that were owed to us in arrears. So then we move on to expenditure. Personnel represents 72% of the total expenditure for the general corporate fund. And uh, these projections anticipate that we would continue to see wage increases at rates that are similar to what the board has done in the last two years, which are right at about a 2% level. The projections also anticipate that health insurance costs will go up 10% per year, and I'm just hoping that that is enough. Um, so this is what personnel looks like over this 10-year period. You can see again that general corporate was at its highest uh, point in 2009, and then we began cutting. And it isn't until 2013 that we get back to the level where we were in 2009. Um, and moving forward, the only thing I will say about personnel projections, this is based on currently what we spend for personnel. It's very difficult to take into consideration what the impact of attrition or turnover will have. Sometimes it saves us money in some areas, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so do I really think that we'll see personnel expenses go up actually this much every year? Well, the furthest year out, I would say probably not, but this is like a worst case scenario for you to look at in terms of what we would expect in projections. Does that reflect no change in headcount? It reflects just, no just change in headcount, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, commodities and services are basically projected to increase with an anticipated rate of inflation. However, with commodities, we tend to be spending less and less as there is a diminishing need to purchase some commodities because of the improvements that we get through technology. Um, so those, and you go back to the key assumptions, you'll see exactly where the percentages are. Services overall are anticipated to increase annually at 2%. Um, some services are not anticipated to increase much at all. Others will probably go up more like 5 or 6%. That's worked through in the total, but at, at the end of the day, the total looks right at about 2%. And again, you can see that in 2009 and 10, we cut back extremely in, in what we spent on commodities and services. And it isn't until about 2015 that we get back to actually spending what we were spending in fiscal 2008 based on these projections. Gary? Uh, could you describe what, what we're talking about? As, as, I'm sorry. Could you uh, describe as what we're talking about uh, uh, in uh, the area of services? <clears throat> well, there are a lot of them, but um, basically off the top of my head, uh, we have uh, services for the sheriff. We have utilities costs, um, food services, um, MetCAD services, um, uh, any kind of professional services, attorney's fees, engineering fees, although we don't have that many of that in general corporate fund. And then a lot of the um, repair and maintenance lines for the physical plant department are considered services as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, waste hauling, custodial, you know, all those kinds of things. Transfer to capital, um, an annual transfer to capital is to cover for the purchase of vehicles other than the sheriff's vehicles and technology and furnishings for the general corporate fund departments to be replaced in the next fiscal year and ideally on an amortized contribution basis for all of those items to be replaced in their next cycle, their next life cycle. 
Um, in 2007, the County Board also initiated transfers to capital for facilities and improvements and replacement. Since 2008, so what you're going to see here, the transfer for cap to capital has not been fully funded. All we have transferred is what we needed to transfer in order to replace whatever was scheduled to be replaced in that fiscal year. So there's a great big jump in fiscal 2014 because it includes that $313,000 recommended by facilities to finance to begin financing uh, roof replacement projects. Um, and that's included in all years. The additional 125,000 to get back on track with funding future reserve, which we will not be able to do until fiscal 15 when we add another 125,000 to that figure and then we will be back on track for funding future, re future reserve of all the technology and equipment that is covered by the capital fund. So in summary, this is what the general corporate fund looks like. And you can see that in 2008, we spent more than we brought in. But um, since then, 9, 10, 11, and 12, every year we have managed to um, keep our expenditures under our revenue levels. Right now, 13, as we talked about earlier, this is based on the current budget. There is a, there is a deficit of expenditure, uh, of revenue to expenditure. Moving forward, based on these projections that we've just looked at, 2014 looks balanced, but then in 2015, 16, and 17, expenditure begins to creep ahead of revenue. That is the structural deficit of the general corporate fund. We have about 50% of our revenues in property taxes and sales and income taxes that tend to grow with the rate of inflation or grow as the economy grows. And we have about 50% of our revenues, which are the fees, and then miscellaneous revenues, which include interfund transfers and some intergovernmental revenues, which tend not to increase that much. So we have 72% of our expenditure is in these personnel areas where they constantly go up, and only 50% of our revenues are simultaneously increasing based on that, those cost of living factors. So it's just something that the county, it's always been that way, it's just true, but it requires careful management. And with including the capital numbers now in 14, fiscal 14 through 17 to maintain that, it's easy to abandon capital first, and it's just an area that the county board is going to have to be cognizant of in your decision making moving forward. Uh, fund balance and the forecast. Um, our fund balance, you can see, and starting at the beginning of this time period, was below where it needed to be in fiscal 2008. That followed a period of time where we um, we loaned a lot of money, where we basically gave money from our fund balance to the nursing home between 2005 2008. That's how it got to the point where it was below the fund balance goal. Um, it, it got worse in 2009, but it in 2012 and 13, we have managed to get the fund balance right at or right above the fund balance goal. But you can see with the projections that have been provided, it would look, we would see an increasing, um, you know, shift in, in our ability to maintain that. So again, that's important. Deb, do these numbers that you're going through with us right now include the money will potentially be getting back by the reduction in our debt service that you just talked about a yes. few minutes ago. Okay. That's all those key assumptions are built into all okay. these totals. And I know this is kind of like flying at 30,000 feet, but it's all built into that. Okay, so the public safety sales tax fund um, directly correlates to uh, the general corporate fund because um, you have discretion in how you use these monies. And obviously a lot of what occurs in, public sa in the general corporate fund are public safety initiatives. When we first, um, when we first adopted the public safety sales tax fund, it was primarily for the debt service. There are basically, the revenue source is the sales tax, the quarter cent sales tax. We have at times had um, interfund transfers from the courts automation fund because we pay for justice technology out of public safety and courts automation has also provided some of the monies for some of those purchases when it was appropriate. You can see in 2008 we had interest earnings, but we really haven't had any since then because the interest rate is so low. They're there, but you can't even see it because it's like $100 and it's low. Um, the expenditures for the public safety sales tax fund, as I said, debt service is the largest expenditure from the fund. Um, you'll see that in 2011 it dropped. That's because we paid off the last satellite jail bond debt service in 2010. 
And when we issued the courthouse bonds, there was that one year where um, before we ramped up then and expedited the debt service payments for the courthouse and, and juvenile detention center bonds. So in 2011, we spent less for that reason. Uh, the 5% for delinquency uh, prevention programming um, is, is there. It, it, it dropped when the, it's based on 5% of the previous year's revenues. So it dropped when the revenue dropped but um, is back on track and moving forward anticipates whatever growth the sales tax uh, sees will also increase there. Justice technology, um, we pay for the New World system, which the sheriff uses. Uh, the maintenance on that system is about $100,000 a year. And then the technology replacement for the state's attorney, sheriff, um, court services, and coroner are paid out of the public safety sales tax fund. And the, sales the public safety sales tax basically purchased originally the Jano system and the New World system in 2002, um, and now just pays for the maintenance of those systems and that technology. Um, facilities maintenance, uh, for, a, for, for many, many years, we've paid the utilities cost for the public safety buildings from as a transfer back to general corporate from public safety. And then finally, additional transfer to general corporate. In 2008, 9, 10, and 11, when general corporate was faced with so much difficulty because of having to cut back because of lost revenues, we transferred additional monies from public safety sales tax in those years. That stopped with the fiscal 12 budget and has not occurred since then. And then you'll also see that little purple in 2013. That is um, the contract with ILPP for the jail needs um, assessment study that is currently being done. So when you look at the public safety sales tax fund, you see in those years when we did the additional transfer to general corporate, we were spending more than we were bringing in. You see the correlating drop in this sales tax revenue in 20, 2009, like we saw in all the other sales tax revenues, um, and that it has increased since then. Right now, um, 20, 2011 and 2012, there was a slight change there, uh, but moving forward, we project that this sales tax will increase at about 2.5%, slightly less than the general sales tax, which includes vehicles, and, and there seems to be, um, that seems to work better for the general quarter cent. The green area shows the fund balance for the public safety sales tax funds, which is maintained right at about the $4 million level, which you probably all think, my goodness, that looks really good. Well, here's why. Because um, the primary commitment of the public safety sales tax fund is the bond debt service, and our bond ordinances require that we have 125% of each year's debt service on hand so that we can abate the property tax, which you do every year for that debt service, so that we pay for it with the, with the sales tax instead. So you can see that after we um, spent down, we spent more than we were bringing in, that, that, that um, the, sale, the, the fund balance dropped by 2010, and that's the year and also in which the debt service dropped, but it is back up and the debt service is increasing, which causes the fund balance goal to also increase. So we're slightly below it in uh, 14, 15, and 16, but get back to the point where we're on track by fiscal 2017. Finally, the capital asset replacement fund. Um, this is looking back to when it was first uh, initiated in fiscal 2001. And one reason I wanted to show you this because from fiscal 2001 to 2007, it was fully funded with the exception of fiscal year 2003 because again, the recession in 2002 caused us to not fully fund it in 03, but that only lasted for one year. So to get it started, general corporate had to be putting in more than $700,000 to start to get started, where you're, you're buying everything that needs to be bought next year and doing the amortized, amortized schedule, which is basically five years, for everything else. But you can see that once you get started, you know, four, five, six, that, that number comes down significantly once you've generated the base. Then you look at eight through 12, and all we've funded is the current expenditures. So we're back to a point where we have to go back to what we did in 2001 in order to get it going again. Once we get it going, it will come down as an expenditure again and be more stable. Um, this is looking at 2007 through 2017, and um, you can see that the fund balance by 2013 has dropped significantly. It's dropped 
by $800,000 since its high point in fiscal 2010. Um, revenue has been less than expenditure each year up until 2014 where again, we're anticipating transferring those monies from general corporate so we, can, we begin putting in more revenue than expenditure. You showed that trailing off of the fund balance and this is where it's going. The oh, our fund general fund corporate balance. fund so balance is that, coming that, in here. That, That's right. That downward trend in the yeah. fund balance is because we'd be putting because money we're in because we would be doing. That's part of it for sure. Another part of it would be if we actually spend as much as pr was projected in expenditure because right. of personnel and things like that. Yeah, it's like an eight hundred thousand dollars swing. Year, yeah. That's right. Sure. And the treasurer will tell you, he keeps, um, he keeps the capital asset replacement fund and the general corporate fund in combined funds. So they do, whatever is in capital asset replacement in the fund balance works to the benefit of the general corporate fund, especially in this time period when um, we're waiting for the property taxes to come in. Um, but as you can see, it's so low that it, there's not as much there to support the general corporate fund as there was back in 2010. Continuing long-term challenges that have been documented by you, the county board, that impact the general corporate fund are maintaining the fund balance, uh, continuing to work on the development of a comprehensive plan for facilities and campuses, but with this forecast, I think you have begun doing that. Um, and especially the next bullet point, appropriation of funding for capital replacement and improvement. And then one that's out there, and we don't talk about all that often, but replacement of the uh, real estate tax cycle and accounting system software has been identified to you by your outside auditor as something that need, we need to look at. So we're starting to work on facilities and those issues, but we need to not forget that there are still some other items out there that will require the board's attention as we move forward. I was going to point out something too. I think all the board members understand this, but for anybody who's watching, we talk about a 12.5% fund balance. Essentially that means that at the end of the year, the general corporate fund has 12 and a half percent <laughs> here he has 12 12 to 12.5 percent balance on on paper the general corporate fund isn't sitting there with 12.5 percent of revenues in the bank in fact right now it's negative and we right. had to borrow a million dollars on public safety sales tax fund right. to, to, to right. compensate for that so this is this is not a big pot of money no. that is sitting there not, not earning interest uh, it's essentially just the difference in Revenue, the integrated difference in revenues or expenses over the over the long term. Right, it's it's what you need to have in December, in order to be able to pay your employees through May. I mean, that four million dollars becomes four hundred thousand by the middle of March. So it's essentially a cash flow management goal. Exactly. To make sure that we don't have to borrow money, mm -hmm. to make payroll. Right. while we're waiting for our, our right. real estate taxes right. to come in. So it's not some magic bank account that we're trying to have no. a certain amount of money in. It's no. a cash flow time of the year situation. That's, That's right. correct. It's an annual Thank you. snapshot. It's not a pool. It's not a pot of money. Yeah, and for taxing bodies who do not have it, they would probably be required to issue tax anticipation warrants because that's the only way to manage then that, that revenue stream that comes in in such a concentrated time to cover all your cash needs. I'm sorry, Josh. Um, my question is kind of back on the public safety uh, fund. Um, the idea that we have to have, what is it, uh, 1.25 years worth of debt service in reserve, is that an ordinance passed by this body? Is that a requirement by our bonding agencies? Is that state requirement? That's the bond ordinances require okay. that. And, and that bond ordinance, bond ordinance was... Was that a state bond ordinance or our bond ordinance that we well, passed as a county board? It's, it's, it's a requirement. Um, it's a statutory requirement, but it is in every right. bond ordinance for okay. debt service that you have done that is so, along those lines. It's not 1.25 years, right? It's 125%. It's, 1 point, it's 125% of that year's payment. Right, which adds up to one and a quarter year's worth of payments. Not necessarily. It depends on, I mean, it's just based on that current year. If next right. year's debt service was much lower or much right. higher, it wouldn't be... Right, and then that, that fund adjusts from there. Right. Okay. It's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. And I, to just be honest, I, I really don't foresee the situation of the story where Champaign County doesn't get any revenues for 15 months straight. So. Well, but the other reason for it is that um, 
You know, that looks like $4 million, but we make those principal and interest payments on January 1st. Right. So at the end of January, it's not $4 million sitting in public safety sales right. tax because, yeah, we basically just yeah, paid it all out. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not sitting so there all the time. So it's next year's payment kind right. of what we're doing because we right. pay it at the beginning of the year. Exactly. The next okay. quarter of the year. That's where I wanted to hear. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, one other comment I was going to make about sales taxes. Uh, one other comment I was going to make about sales taxes. Uh, there is some effort by the feds to work on, I guess, what we could call the Amazon bill, which if the feds can figure out how to force online retailers to actually collect sales taxes could have a significant impact on our sales tax revenue in addition to preventing online retailers from continuing to rob local businesses by helping Illinois taxpayers cheat on their taxes. But I'll get off my soapbox now, but that's another thing that might work out to, to our good in the long run. Uh, are there any, any other comments? Ms. Petrie. Um, yes, on page 101 in Commodities and Services, under Commodities, uh, is that where the utilities are listed? It was services, utilities I think. Are in services. Okay, but it's in this graph. Okay. Yeah. So looking at this graph, then it says to me that it uh, would certainly uh, help the outcome of this graph if we put more and more emphasis on working toward energy efficiency with all of our buildings because our utility bills are, they always take my breath away when I look at them every, um, every month. And so that brings me back to, um, well, I think it's in our agenda, but it's on page 96, number three, and that is appropriation for roofs to be replaced in those years. And my takeaway from the last facilities committee meeting uh, was the sense that the committee members um, were acknowledging roofs may be one of the things that need to be uh, repaired, but they preferred more flexibility in the terminology of that fund so that if advantages, uh, there might be advantages to do other things that are needed to be done within the county, especially if grant money was available to do it. So um, could that uh, word ruse be uh, replaced with something else that was more generalized? Well, then the numbers are based on the recommendation um, that was presented to facilities and where roofs were identified. Um, there is nothing that keeps the county board from spending that money on something else if it's determined that it isn't required for a roof. This is just to get us started in funding. The department budget that that money goes into is the capital asset replacement facilities budget. It, it, we will put money in and earmark it for certain things, but that doesn't mean that that's what it has to be spent on. Um, we use flexibility in that fund as much as possible. You know, when we first started capital asset replacement, we had printers for every department. We've managed to get rid of printers through our copier services uh, contract, but where sometimes money was reserved for a printer, maybe a department needed a laptop, so we, what had been reserved for the printer could now get used for the laptop, and moving forward, that's how we do it. I would expect that anything spent out of the facilities capital asset fund is going to be directed by this board. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. McGuire. Being involved in some of the discussions of the roofs of the buildings and the maintenance of the buildings and working for the university's facilities and services, uh, in the discussion about the, you know, the budget itself and its likelihood that uh, it'll be unbalanced. If one of the roofs and the buildings go out and it's $300,000, it's like one of our um, payments for payroll. So if we put it off and we need it repaired or have to do it, and we don't have the funds in, in this fund that we're trying to build, then we have a, a problem. So I, I hopefully that we're, we're ready to, to, to work on you know, having this fund for facilities because we put it off for a long time and there's really a huge debt in our facilities budget. So uh, uh, we also still have an issue where the nursing home could lose money from Medicaid that we've talked about in the last few months. Um, so I appreciate all this information about our, what, where our budget's going. Um, um, I'm interested in some of these issues. 
of energies of energy efficiency. Um, but I, I like the direction we're going with this. Thank you. I think it's a good point. If we were a company, we'd be showing a loss every year as a result of not of the depreciation we'd be taking on those buildings. I mean, the buildings are aging. Uh, it, we don't have to claim that as an expense, but every year in which we let a building get a year older without contributing it to its upkeep is, uh, is essentially a phantom expense. And I think what we're doing is not so much saying we need to start investing in buildings as we need to stop not investing in our, in our buildings. <laughs> Ms. Berkson. Oh, we're saving on our taxes if we if we paid them. Uh, any additional comments or questions for Ms. Busey? If not, I want to say thank you for the effort that went into this. Uh, I think this is one of the better pictures we've gotten in the last several years of of where we've come from and where we're going, and hopefully we'll be able to. Uh, to use this in the budget process and stick to this. Um, there's no other business for finance. I have no chair's report. Uh, items for consent would be A2, D1 and 2, E1 and F3. That concludes Thank finance. You. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. That was an excellent report. Thank you, Deb. Um, let's move on to justice and social services. Ms. Berkson. Very brief. That's okay. Uh, does somebody want to move to accept the monthly reports? I make a motion to accept all the reports and place them on file. Uh, James and Mitchell. Okay. All in favor? Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. The other thing is you have. Uh, resolution at your desk. You remember uh, some time ago a judge in the western part of the state ruled that people on mandatory sentences, which you can have for all sorts of things like traffic, uh, could not serve their sentences on an anklet. They had to be in the jail. And that cost, you know, the cost for that is about 20 people, about half a million dollar a year. It's all over the state, it's costing you money. And in addition, of course, when you put somebody in jail, he loses his job, very often his home, sometimes his family, and he's not likely to get another job. So the whole community suffers. Whereas if you put a guy on an ankle bracelet, he pays for the ankle bracelet, he pays for probation, he... Uh, keeps his job, he keeps his home, he keeps his family, and he keeps paying his taxes. So, you know, we really have a very big interest in having people, suitable people, serve their sentences on anklets. So Naomi and Frerichs have been working very hard on getting a law through the legislature that says that home detention is suitable uh, that it serves man for, uh, for mandatory sentences. And what this does is say we, we, we support that. Yeah. I, well, I was just going to move that we adopt this resolution. All in, any discussion? And, uh, yeah. This was a change, what, uh, did you say three years ago or so? I remember a couple, this happened. I think. A couple of years ago. I remember this happened. Yeah. It, it kind of hampered what, what, especially here in the county we were doing, yeah. with sentencing. And it, uh, it, it is a, a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage for everybody, I think. Yeah. It's an extra cost to our court system, and it's also a cost to you know, a nonviolent individual, yeah. non-crime right. individual that uh, could better be served uh, in home detention, so I, yeah. I, I hope this passes. Thank you for bringing this forward, Ms. Person. Okay. Yeah, uh, Just two quick comments. Um, one, this obviously doesn't mean that everybody gets let out of jail and goes on home detention. This is still subject to the discretion of the sheriff as far as who no, would be eligible for this and who would not. And second, this decision by this judge is costing us half a million dollars a year, taxpayers' money, so absolutely we should support this. Okay. Okay, uh, all in favor? 
All opposed? That's all I have, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, at this point, there's no other business. Uh, call for adjournment. So moved. Kibla, second, James. All in favor, thank you. Motion carried. Oh, yeah, uh, sorry. On your desk um, is a flyer. There will be uh, Dr. Kalmanoff has rescheduled his, uh, his uh, presentation on uh, ILPP. Uh, it's going to be um, going to be April 17th, Wednesday evening, 6.15 to 8.15, Urbana Public Library. Uh, and it's, um, it's, let me see, who's uh, presenting the new I'm sorry, what? Okay. Uh, yes, sir. There's your flyer. Thank you.